Do you ever read bumper stickers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I do too. And uh, some of them are pretty fascinating, I must admit. And uh, some take a bit of thinking to figure out exactly what they're trying to tell you. Well, I, I, came, I remember seeing a bumper sticker a couple years ago that uh, it said this, he who has the most toys wins. Yeah, and I remember thinking to myself, oh, no, 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 that's, that's not true, that isn't true, that's, that's crazy talk. But then I, I, the more I thought about it, the more convicted I got. The more I thought, boy, if people were to follow me around and really watch my life and the things that I accumulate, would they conclude by looking at me that, yeah, there's a guy who thinks and believes that same model. You, know, you, could, you could write that over, over the doorposts of the way in which he operates and acts and spends his money, that he thinks, too, that the person who has the most toys wins. Well, I was reading a, a, a little book again that I haven't read for a while that I picked up by John Piper called Don't Waste Your Life. Now, if you haven't read it, get it. It's, it's a good read. And uh, in this book, uh, one chapter in particularly called Living to Prove He is More Precious Than Life. John Piper challenges us to think about the words in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, where Peter talks about us giving a reason for the hope that we have within. And John writes, when you look at your life, do people actually ask you of the hope that you have within? And if they don't, you need to think about why. Why aren't they asking me? And is it possible? Because, frankly, when people look at your life, the hope that you project is the same hope they have. Their hope is in stuff. Their hope is in wealth. Their hope is in getting by from day to day. Do we live as if we're on the road to Calvary? Do we live, like John Piper, Piper says, as if we are in a war? Because frankly, we are. Do you and I live in such a manner that we exhibit that we treasure Christ more than our stuff? Is that the reason that they don't ask us? Well, we're going to look at a parable this morning called the unjust steward from Luke 16 that John read for us that's going to help us learn to treasure God more than our stuff. And it's interesting to discover as you read the commentators that they say that this is the most difficult parable in Luke's gospel. In fact, J.C. Ryle writes this. He says, there are knots in which perhaps uh, we will never in this world untie until the Lord comes again. Well, I'm going to try and unpack some of the knots, untie a few of these knots. I'm not going to do all of them, I'm sure. But I remember thinking this when I read this parable for the first time. What am I going to do with this? Yikes! And thinking, man, what am I going to pull out of this for the, for the hearts of God's people? I mean, here's the story about a manager who gets caught and fired, and then he's asked to account for his mishandling of his master's goods. And to add insult to injury, this fella then implements a scheme to secure what could have been a very insecure future by calling in his master's debtors and telling each of them, all right, reduce this to this amount, and you can reduce that to that amount. And he does this without his master knowing this at all. His master has no idea that he's just lost, frankly, a fortune by the shrewd, cunning, dishonest manager who's been looking after his stuff. And when the master finally gets wind of all of this, well, we hear his response in verse 9. And again, when I read verse 9, I thought, boy, that wouldn't have been my response. I would have tarred and feathered this guy. I, I, would, have, I would have done what the, uh, what the, what the uh, owner in Matthew 24 did to his wicked servant, and that is he cut him in two. But that's not what this, what this master does with this crooked character. He actually commends him. Now, he doesn't commend him for his thievery, but he commends him for his shrewdness. Listen to verse 9. Very interesting. Well, verse 8 and then 9. 
The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. Well, there it is. Well, that may not be the reaction that you and I would have at all, but that was a reaction that Jesus gives to this manager. And then Jesus comments on this and then elaborates on it a little further in the rest of the story as an application to this parable. Now, I really believe that the key word in this parable is the word shrewd. And you can write that down on that little blank. That's the key word. That's the emphasis of the text, what Jesus wants us to capture. And uh, that word in our dictionary means to be astute, somebody who's very wise, uh, discerning. The Greek has the idea of one who's clever, uh, prudent in the way he thinks and then acts. And really, this unsavory character in our story, (laughs) well, he's completely dishonest, was very clever, wasn't he, in securing what could have been a very uncertain future. In fact, he says that he wasn't willing to dig ditches, and he wasn't willing to beg, and so he wasn't sure what to do, but he obviously thought quickly, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll call on all the debtors, and I'll reduce their debt, and then they will owe me. I mean, a whole lot of them won't be able to turn me away when I come knocking on the door for supper and a room to stay because I have, you know, I've put money in their pockets. They're going to love me kind of thing. And so that's what he does. So this fellow thought ahead. He did. And he got rewarded for it, in a sense. Well, Luke points out in 16 and verse 1 that Jesus told this parable to his disciples. Well, we know from the text, according to verse 14, that the Pharisees were still there and had listened in to Jesus as he told this parable. And so while the Lord Jesus, his focus primarily is on his disciples, on those who are followers of Jesus, the Pharisees and the teachers heard what he said, and so did his audience, I think, in verse 14. Chapter 15 and verse 1, the tax collectors and sinners, I think they were still there as well. And really, when you think about it, this is a group of people who had a keen interest in wealth and money. In fact, often were caught up in it. And so I believe Jesus takes the opportunity to address the issue of stuff and money and answers two critical questions in his parable. And they are these. How should a follower of Jesus handle his money And second, why should he do this? So how should a parable or a follower of Jesus handle his money and possessions? And why should he do this in the first place? Well, I don't know about you, but we tend to get pretty nervous when somebody starts talking about money and stuff. And the first thing we do is grab our wallet. You know, you're not talking or getting into my wallet. And it's it's like the the topics of politics and religion. They're no-nos. Well, so, frankly, is the personal use of money. That's like a no-no. Off limits. Don't go there. And yet, when you get into the Word of God, you discover that the Bible has a whole lot to say about money and wealth. In fact, John MacArthur, in his book called Whose Money Is It Anyway, comments that out of the 38 parables that Jesus spoke, 16, 16 were on money and possessions. That's kind of staggering. In fact, Jesus taught more often about stewardship than he did about heaven and hell combined in the Scriptures. And if you work your way through God's Word, you discover that there are over 2,000 references just to wealth and property, which is twice as many references as there are to the topics of faith and prayer. So you boil us all down, God really does care a great deal about how we handle what he's given to us. And God understands very clearly both the blessings money and possessions can be, but also the dangers that money and possessions can pose in our lives. If you think about it, your spending and the use of your resources is a huge window into your, stole, into your soul. If you look at the way in which you spend your money, it can tell you a great deal about the things in your life that are priorities, the things that you consider to be important above all else. 
This is certainly the case with this NBA baseball player I read about. He was in negotiations with his team, and he'd been offered, listen to this, $14.8 million for a single year. And this NBA player was absolutely disgusted with such an offer. And when the media sat him down and asked, why on earth are you disgusted with $14.8 million? I mean, don't you want to help your team win the NBA this year? And, and frankly, can't you worry about a better deal in another year? Why aren't you willing to play ball, if you wish, with your team? And this NBA fellow replied to the, to the interviewer. He said, why on earth would I want to help them win a title? They're not doing anything for me. I'm at risk. I have a lot of risk here. I got a family to feed. 14.8 million? Sign me up. Anyway, but so here, <laughs> you think about it. Really, we aren't, we aren't exempt from the same danger, are we? Of allowing what we have or what we don't have or what we sh think we should have to dictate the state of our hearts. So here Jesus is going to help us a great deal. And, there, and what he focuses in on in this parable is the whole concept of you and I as followers of Jesus being wise stewards. Being wise stewards. Now, stewardship is a topic we don't tend to talk about a lot. But Jesus reminds us that, frankly, we are all stewards. We are all just trustees and managers of God's resources, just like the man in this parable was to his, his manager's stuff. And the truth is, when you boil it all down, frankly, you own nothing. You own nothing. Every dime you make, every inch of your home, every talent you possess, everything you've got, every breath you breathe, in fact, even your children are a gift from the living God. You really own nothing. And the Word of God is very clear to us that God not only, not only is the rightful owner of everything that there is, but He's also the one who is the determiner of who gets what and how much they get. I mean, let me just read one passage of Scripture that reminds us that God owns the whole enchilada, if I can put it that way. S Psalm 24, listen to verse 1 and 2. The, Lord, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. So there it is. And, and I really believe John Wesley had it right when John Wesley found out that his house had burned down and it was nothing but a pile of now ashes and dust, his reply was this, well, the Lord's house has burned down, one less responsibility for me. So, we are all stewards of everything we will ever have. And the question that the text is wanting us to wrestle with is, what will you do with what God has given to you? How will you use it? And I really believe the message of this parable is simply this, be a wise steward of God's resources. Be a wise steward of God's resources. And so let's dig in this morning and look at three points that are going to help us be wise stewards of God's resources based on this parable in Luke chapter 16. The very first thing I believe the Lord Jesus tells us and identifies as a characteristic of a wise steward is that they are gospel-focused on every opportunity. They're gospel-focused with every opportunity that comes their way. Now, listen to Jesus' observation about this dishonest manager, manager's actions. And he comments on this in verse 9. Listen to what he says as he follows up from verse 8. He says, For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. And here the Lord Jesus makes a very clear distinction, and you'll notice this, between the people of this world and the people of the light. 
And let's be very clear here, Jesus in no way is commending you and I to be dishonest in our use of God's resources. That's not what he's telling us. But rather, the Lord Jesus here is making it very clear that we are, that the world acts in a more shrewd way than often the children of light. What does he mean by that? Well, simply this. Jesus is telling us that the world tends to be far more consistently energetic and focused on taking care of their physical needs, on their personal wealth, on the possessions that they believe they've got to have, and they do so throughout the entirety of their lives, then do the children of God in their concern for eternal matters. Many in our world are caught up with just pouring all kinds of resources in in padding their cell, aren't they? In getting just as much as they can. One more dollar. One more dollar. And, And yet, you and I often neglect our own souls. Yet we have the greatest treasure that there could be. Christ himself. And so the Lord Jesus is reminding us here that we need to be individuals who are more shrewd than the world. We need to be making the most of every opportunity that comes our way for eternal purposes. We need to be thinking ahead. We need to be looking ahead. We need to be planning ahead in regards to the gospel and spiritual matters. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, he calls us And you know this, he says, redeem the times. And the idea there is that God's people, we are to buy back. We are to take back. We are to reclaim for God what has been lost and hijacked by sin in the fall. And this includes our time and our talents and our minds and our activities and the use of our material possessions. Let's not, not be like the guy who invested heavily And I I actually saw this documentary. He invested heavily in in antiques. And he literally had storage unit after storage unit filled with antiques that he bought over, over years and decades. But then the market for the antiques he had completely uh, collapsed. And he then realized that what he had was a bunch of useless furniture. And when he sat down and looked at his books, he discovered that he had spent over half a million dollars in looking after his antiques in his storage units. And now he had nothing. He had absolutely nothing of any wealth for his future. One commentator says this to us, if we're a child of light, surely the sons of light bound for eternity ought to be more active, more zealous, more mindful, more wise about redeeming the time, preparing for the future, laying up treasures in heaven. And so I want you to think about your past week. Which did your life and the use of what you have contribute to? Did you contribute more to the advancement of the kingdom of God? Or did your life and the use of what you have contribute more to the advancement of earthly possessions? I don't know about you, but I just, I just turned 60. And I'm acutely aware that I may only have a few decades left, if I'm lucky. Now, if you look at the Ingram longevity, it cuts off at about 75. So I might have 15 years and then adios amigo. And so, you know, you've got to think about this. And I've been thinking a lot lately that, Lord, if I only have maybe a few decades, I want to use the bulk of my life. And what I have, I want to invest it in kingdom matters. I want, it, I want to be concerned more with the eternal than the temporal. Because only the eternal is what matters. And one of the best ways that we can engage in this and be wise stewards according to this parable is by following what Jesus says in verse 9. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now, the Lord Jesus isn't telling us here at all that you and I can buy our way into heaven or we can purchase heaven for somebody else by using our worldly wealth. That is not what Jesus is saying here at all. Rather, what Christ is encouraging us is this. Let's take as many people as we can home to glory by by using 
what he refers to as worldly wealth in righteous and intentional and in gospel ways so that our reuse, so that when our resources are finally our, our resources are finally used up or were used up as the text says they're gone then what we have left we've invested in eternity and so the question that remains in scripture is do you live with an understanding of the value and the scope of the gospel in the way in which you live your life i mean let's be frank when you and i came to christ the gospel transforms us doesn't it it changes us entirely it changes who we are it changes what we do but it also transforms our view of what we have and how we use it matthew 6 19 and 20 where jesus says don't store up treasures here but store up treasures there really is identifying a characteristic of the follower of Jesus. His view of stuff here has changed. It no longer gets calling the shots. Rather, he sees it as a commodity, if I can put it this way, for gospel use. To be used for a greater good. And so no longer is life to be lived just for us, but now we live life because of the transformation of the gospel for the good and concern for others and no longer do we live just for ourselves but now we live for the glory of god and no longer do we live just to accumulate a whole bunch of stuff but rather now we use that stuff for gospel purposes think about this when the apostle paul was was in jail and he wrote to the philippian believers paul could have just simply clammed up and and uh, and had a pity party Oh, woe is me, look at this. Chain to this smelly fellow over here and this fellow over here. And it's cold and it's damp and, and I, and, and oh boy, you know, what, what's this? Uh, God, really? But no, what, the, what he tells the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 1, 12 and 14 is that he used this situation to advance the gospel to the point that the entire empirical guard had heard the gospel through Paul. That's what I'm talking about. Think about this. The, the, the record of the early church in Acts chapter 4, 32 to 35 tells us that no one in the entire church had a need because those who had a little more sold off their property to make sure that everybody's needs were met. That's what I'm talking about. Think about Dorcas in chapter Acts 9 and verse 36 where it's recorded that she was a lady who was full of good works and acts of charity. That's how the gospel transforms a life. Think about the witness that Paul records in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 1 and 2, where he says that the churches in Macedonia, who frankly gave generously to the church in Jerusalem out of their extreme poverty. That's what I'm talking about. See, that's how, that's the transformation that the gospel makes in our lives that affects everything about us including what we have. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, 14 and 16, marries together both our witness and our good works, and he reminds us that, that together they are to be a witness for Jesus Christ in all that we do. And so let me ask you this. Will there be a welcoming committee in glory awaiting your arrival because you poured yourself into the lives of others for the sake of the gospel. Because you gave yourself for the purpose of witnessing for Jesus at the, at the expense of your own reputation. Because you were willing to invest what you had in kingdom purposes, in seeing missions in the church and church planning and outreach and evangelism and disciple making go forward because you believe that was a matter of eternal matters. Will there be a welcoming committee in glory awaiting you? Because second, Jesus tells us in the text that not only is a wise steward one who uses every opportunity for the gospel, but they are submissive with what they have. Listen to Jesus in verse 10 to 12. Here's what he now says to us. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest 
with much. So if you had not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with somebody else's property, who will give you property of your own? Now Jesus deals with the attitude of our stuff in this text. And I want you to notice the contrast that Jesus makes here in verse 10 uh, to 12, and the contrast between the words little and much, worldly wealth and true riches, trust and dishonesty, between somebody else's property and your property. And you'll notice that the word that comes up four times in these verses is the word trust. 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 And so the point Jesus is making is, are you a person who can be trusted with the little? And maybe with the much. Because a person's true character is seen in how they, how they handle the small, insignificant things in their lives and how they handle the little things that they've got, according to the text. Small things, small choices matter to the living God. Remember the widow who put just a couple of pennies in the offering plate, and that was commended by Jesus? He commended her for her faithfulness. It didn't look like much, and it frankly wasn't in human terms, but in, in, the, in the definition of eternity, it was huge. And the living God had noticed her full devotion, even in the small things. And so the determining factor that Jesus is speaking about here isn't how much you've got, but rather the determining factor is, are you faithful with what you've got? Are you utilizing what God has entrusted to you for gospel purposes? Do you live with the perspective that you are nothing but God's steward? And everything you have belongs to him. And it isn't your right to do with it as you please. Rather, you're to do with it for his pleasure. Do you live with the perspective that that really the best is yet to come for the believer and that someday you will abandon the temporal and you're going to exchange it all for the eternal? The call of Scripture is Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. This is what we're called to in regards to our stuff. Listen to Paul here as he is, in fact, speaking to slaves at this point. And here's what he writes, verse 17. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And so our constant desire as followers of Jesus, as wise stewards of God's resources, is that we are to be demonstrating to a watching world that God is worth more than all the wealth this world can possess. That Jesus is our greatest treasure above and beyond anything we have in our homes. It is Jesus. It is Jesus who's our, our treasure. And so the question you need to be asking yourselves throughout the entirety of your day is this. How will this choice or action help me to treasure Jesus more? And will this choice or action that I'm about to take show to others that I do treasure Jesus above all else? That Jesus is the all-satisfying and central joy of my life. I remember reading this story about a medieval king. He had a fortune. And his instructions were, when I die, I want to be buried with my fortune. And that's exactly what they did. When the king died, they buried him with his fortune. In fact, they, they put him on his throne, put his crown on his head, and then they took his finger and he, they opened the Bible and put his finger on one verse in the Bible. Matthew 6, 19 and 20. It was a warning to anyone who found this king years later that if you think the accumulation of wealth is all there is and the best thing you can do with your life, you are wrong because here's a man who accumulated great wealth but he forfeited his entire soul to gain this, the, the wealth of the world. Don't follow in his footsteps was the warning. You see, faithfulness in managing what belongs to God now, I believe Jesus tells us, will lead to possessing in eternity that which we can never, ever lose. 
I remember a lady in the church I was in before I came here who was, had Down syndrome, and I could still see her every Sunday digging through her purse, looking for her change to put on the offering plate, and sometimes it was just a quarter, that's all she had, but she would happily put that quarter with a big smile on the offering plate. And she'd do this because she loved Jesus. And I have often thought, there's a lady who Jesus will reward someday in eternity for her faithfulness. My question to you is, will he reward you? Will there be true eternal riches entrusted to you someday? The words here, I believe, in verse 10 and 12, to 12 of Luke 16 are a wake-up call to us. It's a warning to us that if we spend our days wasting what God has given to us, then don't expect anything of eternal value waiting for you in glory. As one commentator has said, God doesn't reward people for frittering away his resources. The more we waste in ourselves here, the fewer will be your eternal riches in heaven. I mean, think about what Christ says here in verse 11. He talks about true riches in this text. Now, he doesn't define what they are, but he does tell us this, that those true riches are riches that will be given to followers of Jesus who have been faithful in little and much, and that these riches are permanent. They're not subject to, to decay whatsoever because they're stored in heaven. And these riches will be handed out to wise stewards of God's resources by Jesus himself someday. And so the question I have for you this morning is, will there be eternal riches? Are you banking ahead? Are you investing ahead? I mean, the truth is, I really do believe that the parable that comes a little bit later in Luke chapter 16 is an illustration of what Jesus has just spoken about here, where Jesus talks about the uh, rich man and Lazarus. And the point, frankly, is this. Don't forfeit your, eternal re your future eternal reward by mishandling God's resources now. But the wise steward does one more thing. And the reason he invests his resources in kingdom purposes, and the reason he's focused on the gospel constantly is because, thirdly, he's loyal to whom it matters the most. And that's verse 13. Verse 13, listen to Jesus here. He says, No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So now the Lord boils it all down. And now his challenge is directed at our hearts. And now he wants us to think about who is it that you serve the most? Who is sitting on the throne of your heart, truly? Because you cannot serve both God and money. It's impossible. And that's highlighted by the contrasting words of Jesus here in Luke chapter 16, where he contrasts hate, love, devoted, despised. Think about a slave in the days of Jesus. If you were a slave, if that was your occupation, you were to give yourself fully to your master. You were his property completely. You were, you were bought by that owner so that you could meet his needs exclusively. You literally were living life for the benefit of another. And your soul, mind, and body belonged to another. And Jesus is making it very clear here that servanthood is an all-consuming matter. And it was in these days. It was impossible to try and serve two different masters. If you tried that, one would get the attention and the other would not. And the truth of the matter is that this manager in our parable discovered this hard lesson himself as he tried to, to serve himself and his master, and he failed miserably in that attempt. You see, the living God demands from us exclusivity. He demands from us total loyalty. 
And he has every right to do so because not only has he made you, but he's remade you. He has a double ownership over you through creation and through redemption. And so God has every right to expect from those who are his followers full-hearted obedience to him. God will not accept a divided heart, nor does God allow for half-hearted obedience. It's all or it's nothing. And so the underlying question that Jesus repeats here is a repeat from Matthew chapter 6, 19 to 34, and he's asking us simply this, do you treasure God more or do you, do, do you treasure money more? Do you, do you trust in God more or do you, are you trusting more in what you have? The truth of the matter is the acid test that Jesus gives us in Matthew chapter 6 is for you and I to think about what it is we worry the most about. If your heart is worried more about where your next dime is than you're trusting in riches. If you're worried more about kingdom advancement and, the, and how you're displaying the gospel than you're concerned about eternal matters. It's interesting that as you get into the New Testament, there are two metaphors that come up that define very much the follower of Jesus and his relationship to Jesus. Those words are slave and master. In fact, 750 times the word Lord comes up and 100 times in the scriptures the word slave comes up. Now, it's unfortunate that our, well, when they translated the New Testament, and I think it's due to historic reasons and practical reasons, rather than translate the word servant, or the word slave properly, they, they substituted the word slave for servant. But really, if you read the, the New Testament, and you look at Romans chapter 1, 1 as an example, Paul is telling you there that he is a bond slave of Jesus Christ. In many ways, the, the word servant downplays the idea of what it means to be a, a slave of Christ. But the truth is, Jesus in the New Testament is that Jesus wanted every follower to understand that he is the king and that our real work is the gospel and our real freedom is found in knowing him and that our real reward is still ahead of us. Here's the danger we have, is that so many of us want to live with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. We want Jesus plus all kinds of self-gratification and the riches in this world. And we think we can have both. And the truth of the matter is you can't. You can't. That's a path to destruction. That's a path to absolute misery and ruin. Yes, money is a gift to us from God. And there's nothing wrong with us having money and possessions. Not at all. The problem comes in when money and stuff become more important to us than the living God. When we love money and stuff more than we love God. And the, the Word of God is very clear to us in Timothy and other places that the, that the world's riches can choke out the effect of God's Word in us and on us. And so you need to think about this. Follow the money trail. Where does it lead in your life? What does it demonstrate? Who does it portray as being the true master of your life? Because Jesus identifies that what we don't want to be like is like the Pharisees. In verse 14, who, who loved money and sneered at Jesus for his words in this parable. Here's a group of people who lived with one foot in the world and one foot in the church, who thought they could have both. And Jesus makes it clear that that's a state of bankruptcy, that they have nothing of value, that God sees their hearts and realize that they are simply detestable before him. I read this story about William Borden. And William, William Borden was a young man who exhibited stewardship for the gospel. I don't want to end with this. He was a, a young man who, whose dad had made a fortune in the silver mines in Colorado. He was a young man who frankly had it made in the shade financially. He didn't have to work a day in his life if he didn't want to. And William Borden was sent on a, on a 
world cruise by his parents as a graduation gift. Imagine that, eh? Yep. So he literally traveled the entire world by ship. But as he did, he recounts that he, res- he returned home with this resolve. I got to tell you, this thing is driving me bonkers. <laughs> Man, oh man, I don't know. Maybe I'm eating the thing, but here we go. (laughs) But that's the way it is. Anyway, so he returned home with this resolve. Thank you, old boy. Appreciate that. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. I don't think William Borden had to worry about these. Anyway, so he came home with this resolve, I'm going to be a missionary. And the reason he said is because he'd seen the plight of people all over the world that were hurting when his friends discovered that he was determined to be a missionary, they said, you're wasting your life. You're just throwing away your whole life and your fortune. But he was determined. And he went to Yale University. And while he was at Yale University, we discover that here was a young man who had a resolve to, to follow Jesus. He formed a prayer meeting that had over 1,300 students in attendance. He reached out to the students that were incorrigible to bring them to Christ. He went into his community and reached out to widows and orphans and to disabled, and he rescued drunks, and he took people to restaurants who were hungry, and he did all this because of Jesus. This this indicated to me that here is a young man who gave himself to every opportunity for the sake of the gospel. And he never wavered from his goal ever to be a missionary to the Muslims in China. He believed with all his heart that he needed to be about his father's business and was. Upon graduation, he turned down a whole bunch of high-paying jobs that were offered to him. And even his dad said to him, you will never work in my company. Never. But that didn't end his resolve. He knew what his pursuit was. And he recorded this in his Bible. Here was his entry, No Retreats. After finishing graduate studies from Princeton, he sailed. Then he began to sail to China, but he stopped first in Egypt to study Aramaic in 1913. But it was there that he contracted meningitis, which took his life. It's reported that after William's death, his mom found his Bible and discovered that he had written and dated the words under the under the words or had dated the words no. Re, resolve after renouncing the family fortune. And as she read a little further, further, she discovered that under the words no reserve, he'd written no retreat, and his final entry just before his death was no regrets. And so he had he left over eight hundred thousand to dollars to the China Inland Mission and other agencies and on his gravestone in Cairo These simple words were inscribed. Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. And I thought of William. William Borden was a wise steward. He used his time and resources and life for gospel purposes to gain the true riches that he could not lose. And my question to you today is this. What will you do this week to illustrate to a watching world in need of Jesus that apart from Christ, there is no greater treasure to possess and that Jesus is the only explanation for the way you live your life and you spend your money. May it be true of us that it is said someday as people look back over our lives, apart from Christ, there is no other explanation. Amen. Pastor Ken, thank you very, very much for explaining this parable to us and for challenging us. Friends, I think we've had a fantastic summer in the parables of Jesus. Pastor Kevin last Sunday, Pastor Jacob the week before, a very, very poignant application to all of our lives. The Lord is feeding us his word. In this time of COVID, we are being saturated with God's truth, and that's what we all so desperately need, isn't it? I am so glad that you're here today. Some of you are here for the first time since the lockdown started, 
And uh, it's good to see your faces, even though you have a mask on. And um, we're <laughs> amen, amen. And Leonard, I think this is your first time back, so good to see you here today. Um, we want you to stick around and have fellowship with each other. For some of us, it's been a long time before we've been able to connect. So you don't have to hurry out. The foyer is available for you. You can stretch out, social distance with each other, and enjoy each other's company for a period of time. Let's make our conversation be about the Lord and his goodness in our lives as we share and have fellowship with each other today. I um, also want to remind you that this book is coming to you soon. We're hoping it's going to come into the office this week. We've got a number of teams ready to go, and we'll be delivering this book to every household within our church. So uh, you'll enjoy it. Christ and Calam Calamity is the title, Grace and Gratitude in the Darkest Valley. So a wonderful resource for us as we go through the struggles of life. And now may the Lord who owns everything in this world, as Ken reminded us today, equip every single one of us with everything that we need for the doing of his will. And may he work in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.